Fans of the Horus Heresy, thank you very much for joining me for a second video looking at construction and specifically posing of the Sagittarum Guard for the Legio Custodes. Uh, a couple of days ago I posted a video where I went through building and assembling and posing and using some heat softening to modify the pose uh, of a Sagittarum Guard and that's this dude here. It took quite a long time to do the one because I'd not pinned it or anything and it took a bit longer than I thought. I did one out of the five and I'd really wanted to cover more so I thought I'd come back and do another video and to speed things along I've done all the drilling, all the pinning so they're all ready to build now so hopefully this video is all just going to be about assembly. Before we get into that, until I built this guy I'm not appreciated just how enormous the custodians are and to give a sense of scale here we've got um, what I consider to be a pretty big space marine. This is the early crusade honours Legion Centurion wearing artificer armour and he's a big fella. But yeah, he gets a bit dwarfed next to the custodian. So these guys are like giants, even against people who are giants. So that is the plan for this video. Let's talk about tools. Should be fairly simple tools for this because most of the work is already done. A couple of craft knives blunt knife and a sharp knife, we'll probably be using mainly the blunt knife. We've got some, in terms of glues, we've got some medium thin super glue. And then we've also got some polystyrene cement as well, some liquid poly cement. We're using liquid poly cement to do the torsos and super glue for everything else. Right, so we've got four sets of custodian bodies and arms. I've paired all the arms up with the bodies that I want to put them on, so they're all ready to go. Let's make a start on the first custodian. So. As seems to be the um, style for these videos now, I've prepared a list of chat topics again uh, to keep things moving along as I work. And you may be surprised or may not be surprised that I've got some more comments around the Ghost in the Shell anime. Having had a load of, shared a load of observations with you in the last video, I've got a load more having watched it a third time. Yeah, I've got uh, Ghost in the Shell <laughs> to talk about again. That's the first topic I've got. Second topic I've got is I've got a battle report to feed back to you guys. So it was Evil Iron Hands, which was me, so I was playing as traitor for a change. And I was fighting against my friend's Ultramarine Force. So it was a 30k game, 2000 points. So I thought I'd give you a quick overview of some of the things that went on in that game. Yeah, that fits better now. That didn't quite fit, so I just drilled it out a little bit further. The pin was a little bit too long, but that looks better now. The third topic is sticking with the theme of games. The same friend has just bought a copy of a new game from Warlord Games called Test of Honor. And Test of Honor is set in the samurai period of uh, Japan. I think it's 17th century and it's a, a skirmish war game, small battle encounters between Samurai and his supporting war band. So yeah, I, I, we played a game of that, that was good fun, so I'll tell you a little bit about that. And if by some chance I managed to get through all that before I finished building these, I'd uh, just share a few thoughts on, well, a computer game. And of course it's 40k themed and it's Dawn of War because uh, the hype train the, the brakes are off a hype train and it's all getting excited. Everything's getting excited for the release at the, towards the end of this month. So yeah, I thought I might share a few thoughts around that. My pet topic at the moment, Ghost in the Shell. So what is, what, what was my latest on Ghost in the Shell? I've watched the anime through a third time. I also had a few chats with some mates and I've got a, few, a couple more observations of my own about figuring out one of the scenes that I had that I hadn't deduced what the meaning was. So I've got that to talk about. And then a friend, a friend of mine made a very sharp observation about one of the meanings or one of the themes that's explored in the film. And I thought I'd share that with you as well because um, it, was a, it was a bit of classical philosophy. Right, you know, let's just uh, get this connected. Right, let me think. So. There's our little torso doing its thing. Now, how do I want this dude? So the default pose is kind of like a bit of a guns down position. I wonder if I'm, I'm happy with guns down or do I want to repose that? Would be a good repose, I guess. A bit of elbow bending could bring the gun up to bear a bit more. Just let's test fit the head and see how he looks. Does it look interesting enough? 
we can make this look a bit more interesting. Uh, now what do we want? We can either have the torso in that orientation or we can twist the torso to be around there like that. I think I actually prefer it a bit more central, so probably about there, so got that. Now let's just whip these arms off. Got to make pinning these arms makes a whole posing thing. Uh, so much easier to do. Right, anyway, that's gluing now. Also got a flask, my little urn mug. <laughs> it's funny. I bought this this mug a few years ago and it's I don't know if I can get it in shot, but there you go. It's it's kinda like that and it it it's really neat because it has no handle on it. So it fits in the cup holder in my car, or the last couple of cars I've had, really well. The only problem is whenever I hand it to someone at a service station for a coffee, they kind of uh, quite often they'll look at it in bemusement trying to deduce how to actually open it which uh, never fails to amuse me. Right, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the forearm up on this arm to raise, to raise the hand a bit so we'll drop that in there. So Ghost in the Shell, so I've watched the film through a third time and there's two things I was trying to figure out. I was trying to figure out symbolism of the Basset dog is and my thinking, my thought was was the Basset being used as a motif to tell the viewer when an unreal scene is being shown or a, something fake is being shown? And I'm now convinced that that is the case. It also then actually sort of explained the other thing that I'd not deduced about the film, which is the scene after the boat scene when the Major sort of goes into the city of Hong Kong and it shows you a number of scenes but and she kind of sees herself in different positions and and it was a little bit confusing but by figuring the first thing out I understood the meaning of the second thing. We've now got a sharper angle on that forearm so let's try reassemble that and see how the pose looks. So the Basset Hound, yes. So my suspicion was the Basset Hound was representing uh, something that was unreal. And I'm sure this is the case because having watched through back through again, um, the first time I suspected this is when the, uh, when Batu, well, when the, the team are interrogating the refuse worker who had, um, who had had his mind hacked. And there's a, there's a moment when he is looking at a photo and he said it, he thought it had his wife and his child in it, but of course there's just, a, there is no, it's just him, but you see the Basset Hound in the background. Um, when I watched it again, um, and there's a scene where they talk, they, where they say they went to his, a little shot where they say they went to his apartment and it was just, a, they said it was just a bachelor pad. On the TV, again, there's another scene depict, uh, with, I think, a woman in it, but also there's a Basset dog there again. And again, it's been used as a motif to tell us about something that isn't real. That convinced me that the, about what the Basset hound is signifying is a visual motif that something is unreal. And that was quite neat to deduce that. Now then, the next bit that I was trying to deduce was the significance of this boat scene. However, I'd gone back and watched it through again and I noticed a, a link between the, the scene when, so at the start of the film, um, the Major and Batu chase the guy who's hacked the refuse worker, but in turn is also being controlled by the Puppet Master and they chase him and there's a bit where he kind of, he shrugged them off or he's thrown them off, thrown off Batu's pursuit after the market and, and evaded the major. And he enters an old part of the city, which, and it, it looks, there's no one else around and it has this feeling of being abandoned and run down. As he's walking through this, this zone, you see a silhouette of an aeroplane fly overhead and he stops and he looks up at this. And it's just kind of like a moment in the, it's a moment in this scene. And you just think, okay, it's just sort of like, you know, there's an airplane, fair enough. But when I went back and watched the bit with the Major again, at the start of that scene, 
or the start of that sequence should I say, you see the shadow, so you, you don't see the plane again, well this time you actually see the reflection of its shadow um, in the windows of some buildings as it flies overhead. Well, that was interesting and then I, as I watched this scene again with the Major when she sees herself as a mannequin and uh, someone in a, I think a restaurant or an office, I spotted what's going on and there's a building that's shown kind of at the end of this waterway that looks like, um, if you know it, there's a famous building in New York, an early high-rise building called the Flatiron Building. And this building looks very much like the Flatiron Building and it caught my eye because it's a building I know. And as I continued to watch it, I then realised as she, as she, as a scene, as a sequence path moves along, you see this building in different states of construction. So you, you see the building from a, another shot, sh shrouded in scaffolding. And then the sequence moves along, she sees herself in these different situations, and, and then she passes under the footbridge, and you see the Basset Hound looking down at her. So what's going on here is this scene, the Major is having some flashback memories to her earlier life, or to some earlier life that she had before she became a cyborg. She's having some sort of experience with her ghost, but the part of the city she's in, and the reason I suspect this is because the part of the city that is shown as being live and bustling isn't actually, and it's actually a run-down part of the city. And the visual cue is the, is the aeroplane silhouette between the first scene with the hacked hacker, and that links it through to this scene as well. And, and hence why the buildings are shown in different states. So it shows the buildings in a state of construction and then in a state of use and then in a state of abandonment. So that scene, she's having some sort of, some sort of flashback. And the final clue there for me, so and again, and again you've got the Basset Hound there to signify that something is unreal or not as it is perceived. And then the final clue for me, after a cut, it goes to the um, section nine lab where they've just picked up the the cyborg of the bond of the blonde woman with the which turns out to have the puppet master inside it or occupying it shall we say she's late and i suspect she's kind of like had some sort of like time slip in her mind and i think that was what that whole time sequence was signifying and she doesn't she doesn't explain why she was late um, and it doesn't go, doesn't come back to that. It, it touches on the fact, it just says she was late and she doesn't say anything about it. So that's kind of like the final, or my final sort of like bit that I think I've figured out with the film is that, um, is that scene is a flashback to her earlier life. And maybe the bit in that where you see the school children running. I don't know, is that her as a young child? And there's another bit there where um, there's a, there's lots of visual links with different brand logos. So you see, for example, a Bose, the sound equipment manufacturing company. You see um, an advert for them in the scene with the hacker chase and the hacker fight. You see that again in what I'm calling the flashback scene. That's what I believe is happening there. But yeah, it took a few watchings to put all those bits together. I don't know if I'm not very observant, but um, I think it's... I think, I don't know, I thought that was deliberately subtle that and takes a few watch-throughs to fully appreciate. That was rather fascinating, to be honest. So I got him together. So he's kind of like... So now he's, he's looking a bit more like he's advancing cautiously with his gun. Got it ready to bring to bear. Right, let me check which arm these... So it's this side for the eagle. Uh, there's the that's the eagle, right? So let's just test fit that. These um, these parts fit together very well on the custodian Sagittarium guard. Excellent fit on these plastic shoulder pads onto the resin shoulders. I'm uh, very pleased with how well these fit. Of course, when I don't drop them, but that was that was my own clumsiness just then. I, that was my first final bit on Ghost in the Shell. My second final bit is an observation my friend made to me about 
a general theme or a metaphor for the film, shall we say? And and yeah, I love this. This is a really this is a really good observation, as well as all the all the stuff I talked around with the enlightenment uh, storyline and the um, you know the Corinthian scripture and all that sort of stuff. Observe the film as being as a metaphor for the paradox of Theseus's ship, which is part of Plutarch's philosophy. If you don't know Theseus's ship's paradox. Um, it was a, a thought experiment proposed by Plutarch, the Greek philosopher, and it goes and, it, and it's straightforward. It goes like this: So, if Theseus's ship is made of many, many parts, and over time he has to repair and rebuild the ship and replace damaged parts, eventually every single part in the ship has been replaced, and nothing of its original form remains. So. Once that point is reached, is it still Theseus's ship, or is it something else? I guess a clear link to Ghost in the Shell there, and I suppose you might say the, con the, the theme of transhumanism in general, to say that the major bit of a uh, realising of the paradox of Theseus's ship. So the mage had her body largely, well, almost entirely replaced, or entirely replaced with cybernetic parts and only her, in effect, her ghost remains. So is she still the person she was? Is she now something entirely different having been completely rebuilt or completely replaced? All her original parts, shall we say, have been replaced, yet still she is the major. So yeah, that was a really insightful observation, that. And again, just goes to show how how much deep meaning the writers of Ghost in the Shell got into the anime. It, uh, it continues to impress, and I'm sure there's more in there as well. I've not even, I mean, I've not even touched on any of the Eastern religious significance of the film, so I don't, that's probably because I don't understand it, but I suspect there must be influences in there as well. Please let me know what you think of uh, these latest Ghost in the Shell thoughts. Right, so we've got Custodian 2 built. So he's in more of an advanced, so he's, this first custodian uh, is a, in a firing pose. The second one is in what I might call a cautious advancing position. Yeah, very good. So let's move on to the third guy. So this guy is going to be more of a lowered gun type pose. So a bit more uh, bolt caliber at the ready and observing. Whoops, sorry. That was out of shot then completely, although I don't know if watching some gluing is the most exciting thing. Topic number two. Alright, yes. Battle, battle report time. So, a 30k battle report chat. Last week, actually, I played a game against a friend. I played Iron Hands. Uh, Iron Hands Legion, but I was playing in effect traitor affiliation because my friend, so I was playing evil Iron Hands, oh yes, but my friend was playing uh, his Ultramarine Force and it yeah, it doesn't really seem quite thematically right to play Ultramarines as um, the bad guys. I know that's a cliche, but um, I think in the context of a Horus Heresy thus far, there's not a great deal of evidence for Ultramarines going traitor. But I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure you're going to prove me wrong now in the uh, comment section. Uh, I'll be interested if that is the case. 2,000 point game. Right, which way do I want this? I can have him, have him slightly rotated that way or that way. I, yeah, I quite like this idea of rotating his torso this way a bit. That's going to give him a sort of, he can look down his nose a bit at the world. I don't actually think this needs any reposing. I think we can just go for, probably just go for sticking this one. Oops, come back here. Now I think this is probably just going to... I'm just going to stick this one straight as it is. I'm, I'm actually fairly happy with how that looks. Alright, so this battle report. So 2,000 points. Uh, what did I take? So my force was... Let's see if you can remember this now. I had... My warlord was a Praetor. I had an Iron Halo, a Cyber Familiar, and a Power Fist and a Bolt Gun. One good thing playing Iron Hands 
you can always get your Prey Tours at a 3++ in Vulnerable Save, which is nice. I had three 10-man tactical squads, I had three Apothecarians, I had a tactical support squad equipped with Graviton guns and a Rhino, and the Rhino have a, had a heavy bolter. I had a five-man strong Volkite Culverin heavy support squad as well. Had the Deradio Dreadnought, armed with the Anvilus Auto Cannon Battery and Aeolus Missile System. A 10-man Medusan Immortal Squad, armed with Volkite Chargers and two Grav Guns for support weapons. Is that everything? Oh, and the Medusan Immortals had, had a Land Raider Proteus with an additional Twin Link Las Cannon as their dedicated transport. So, in terms of how I signed my Apothecaries, I put two with Tactical Squads, and then one, uh, one apothecary was then with the heavy support squad, the Volkite Culverins, yes. So that was my force. Oh, there was one other thing. I had my Expeditionary Navigator as a HQ. So I wanted to, I, I'm, I'm wanting to get him into more games at the moment. This is an intriguing unit. Oops, stuck my finger on that. Look at, hey, look at that. Nice bit of a uh, super glue. See, great thing, you see super glue, it, it bonds fingers brilliantly. Useful tip to remember that if you ever cut your finger, you can super glue the cut shut. I wouldn't recommend it though. Yeah, it looks nice. So that was my force. The navigator I attached to a tactical squad. I think actually, no, I, the tactical squads had a bit more than 10. I think I had two of them were 11 strong and one was 10 strong, yeah. Right, my opponent's ultramarine force, what did he have? Right, he had a... His HQ was a chaplain, and his chaplain had a jump pack, and this chaplain was attached to a Loctarus squad, and they had jump packs. They also had three plasma pistols, so they were definitely packing. He had a 10-man destroyer squad, and the destroyer squad had two missile launchers equipped with rad missiles, so kind of like their, yeah, that's a bit of a signature weapon loadout, isn't it, for the destroyers. He had a 20-man breacher squad, I think pretty much just as equipped as they were. No, nothing fancy or anything there. Do you need anything fancy with breacher squads? Not really. I think you might have had some melt guns as special weapons. I'm not. You didn't get them into range, so I can't quite remember that. He had an eight-man missile launcher, heavy support squad. He had a contempt to dreadnought, armed with two twin-linked las cannons, and then he had a twenty-man tactical squad as well. So my opponent's force was much more infantry heavy than mine was, but he had some he had some very high quality infantry. Deployment, so he went for city ruins. He, my opponent won the roll off to set up and go first. So I set up seconds. I deployed mainly in cover. I opted to use the head of the Gorgon, unique right of war. And by doing that, I placed my Rhino with the Graviton Gunners and my Land Raider with the Medusa Immortals in reserve. So that just left me with my Tactical Marines, my Dreadnought, my Deradio, and Warlord, my Praetor, and the Heavy Support Squad to deploy. So I deployed one squad of Marines in the down in the first two floors of a large ruined building. In the upper floor of a ruined, bu ruined building, I deployed the Heavy Support Squad. And then I also put, ooh, what else did I do? I kind of spread my Tactical Marines sort of across the frontage, so. And then the Dreadnought I deployed behind the large building. So basically, I didn't want to take fire on the first turn off his enemy Dreadnought. I'd much rather take a few shots on my Marines. Um, but I didn't want the Dreadnought to get wasted, so I, I deliberately hid it on the first turn. My opponent then reacted accordingly to my deployment. Apologies if the colour balance is a little bit funny on this uh, video, but. I think it's just the ambient light today. Anyway, um, it's not too bad. It just looks, you know, it's a little bit variable, isn't it? The Ultramarine player. Now, what he did for deployment was he, on my left flank, which is a flank with my with the building, I had my heavy support marines. He deployed both his destroyer squad and his Loctaris squad. Slightly off centre on that flank, he deployed his breaches. Centrally. And then centrally, he deployed his tactical squad and his contempt to dreadnought. And then on my right flank, 
so opposing my tactical squad which had a navigator, 11 man tactical squad with a navigator and an apothecarian, he deployed his heavy support squad with the missile launchers. So that were the dispositions of the battle. And straight away I was a bit like, ah, so my I've got a tactical squad on a flank which is in the building but they've got the destroyers and the Loctaris coming for them. So that kind of set alarm bells ringing to start with, with good reason as we'll find out. I didn't seize the initiative, so it was straight over to my mate to play. He had a good first turn. Uh, he he's very rapidly started to move his destroyers and well, his whole force up, but particularly his destroyers and his Loctaris. They immediately made a beeline for the building and start to close on it. Uh, the tacticals and the breach marines advanced in the centre. The dreadnought came out and then they opened fire. At this point, he chose to open fire on my Volkite Culverin unit with his missile launchers and he uh, got good effect. I think he killed two marines with eight shots, which I guess probably isn't too bad, but I still, that was, I still had a, I had a four plus cover save and a five plus feel no pain. So yeah, I might have been slightly unlucky there. No, it's probably about power odds. Where I was unlucky was the bolt of fire. Uh, yeah, from the rest of his troops, he managed to cut down the remaining three Volkite culverin troops. So all that was left was the apothecary and then he unsurprisingly ran away. So that was not the best start. No, it wasn't very good at all really. But you've got to kind of, in 40k, you've got to kind of take these things that happen and deal with them and adapt. So, on my first turn, um, Now, I had a bit of a Hobson's choice here with my tactical marines. I had to decide what I was going to do, the tactical marines in the building. In the end, I decided to hold position and go for Fury of the Legion to get maximum fire. So I actually had good, a good line of fire on his destroyer squad, so that's what I did with them. Right flank tactical marines, this is a navigator unit charged forward, basically making a beeline for his missile launchers. And the dreadnought came out uh, on the, in the centre and then drew a line on his contemptor. And then my other tactical squad uh, started redeploying a bit to the towards the my right flank. So yes, yeah, so that was my first turn. Just pause, pause there a second. So that's custodian three done. So he's looking. Yeah, he's got a nice. I think he's got kind of like a nice imperious pose. He looks. Yeah, he's just looking superior there. Like I think custodians generally should do. Right. So we've got three. Now we're going to move on to the more dynamic moving poses. Right, in terms of my attacks on turn one, um, my Fury of the Legion attack wasn't overly brilliant. I think I scored two, was it two casualties on his destroyers? Maybe three, I think. So it wasn't that great and it wasn't going to make a difference. And at that point, I realized I was uh, in for a bit of a stuffing um, because there was no way I was going to stop all those guys and the Loctaris and of course I also had to decide well do I shoot at the Loctaris and with bolters because you see if you're not familiar with the Loctaris um, they're marines they get weapon skill 5 but as standard they all get artificer armor so in terms of small arms fire it's like fighting terminators and there's 10 of them and they got jump packs and they're fast moving they're very skillful and at this point I was beginning to worry about fighting them with good reason. I did some casualties to his destroyers but it wasn't going to stop anything. Uh, the Duradio had a bit more luck. I think it scored... I think the Duradio scored a hull point on his Contemptor which is good. And then its missiles... Uh, did its missiles do anything? Oh! His missiles scored a couple of wounds on his... Uh, I think it was his breaches but he then... I think he then feel no pain them. There was uh, no positive outcome there. And then I took a few shots at his missile launcher team. I think I got two casualties with my Bolter Marines, so that was pretty good. Friends turn two, his Loctaris and his destroyers were on me straight away. Uh, it was very quick. And they, they charged up and straight away they were gonna have melee. They were in range for melee. So they're basically outside the, you know, outside the building and even, even accounting for the penalties for charging into the building, they were still gonna make it. And his tactical Marines started to move to my right flank a bit to oppose my tactical marines. His breach marines stayed central. Right, let's just think about this guy, how we're going to pose him. 
Now, what pose do we want here? First, we don't want to bend it at all, do we? Yeah, I think I kind of want to bring this arm up a bit. Yeah, it's going to be another wrist job. Let's do that first. His breach marines kept to the centre ground and his tactical squad started to wheel onto my right flank to oppose my tactical marines, which were threatening his missile launcher team. So he opened fire again. I don't actually think he... He actually opted not to shoot with his Loctaris and destroyers, if I remember rightly. I think he might have shot with his destroyers, but he didn't shoot with the Loctaris because he didn't want to hamper his attempt at a charge. He inflicted a couple of casualties. I think he might have got one with his Contemptor. Did he actually get any casualties on my tactical minutes? I don't know if he did actually. I think he might have got one. The Navigator w used his etheric disruption skill, which imposed a minus one to hit on him, which was handy. So actually shooting this round wasn't too bad for me. Certainly not compared to the bloodbath of turn one when the Culverin squad got wiped out. Did I say on the Culverin squad the medic ran away? He ran away. Say the shooting was better, but the close combat was not good now. So he made his charge and all of his guys piled into combat. So I was fighting both his destroyers, which are seven guys, 10 Loctaris and his chaplain. So it, and I had 10 tactical Marines and my Praetor. So I thought, okay, well, I'm going to try and make the best of the worst situation. And I called a challenge out to his chaplain with my Praetor, which was a bit of a dirty trick. But I was playing Evil Iron Hand, so I didn't have any compunction about this. And called him out for a challenge because, you know, clearly a Praetor has got a big advantage over a chaplain. And so how did it work out? Well, the close combat was an absolute bloodbath. I inflict any casualties? Mm, my standard Marines, no. His Loctaris cut my squad down to a man. So yeah, they just, they just chopped them up into small Iron Hand's coloured pieces. It was a very swift and very brutal. Anyone who hasn't ever played Loctaris squads, and if you are going to fight them, beware because they are, uh, they're really good. They're really, really good. <laughs> um, yeah, that combination of artificer armor with jump packs is, uh, is brilliant, yeah. Challenge, well the challenge was better. Um, his, so of course his chaplain struck first because he, um, he, had a, he was armed with a power mall equivalent and he did a wound on my Praetor, so he managed to get one wound past his armour and save. My Praetor then turned around and stuffed him over with his power fist or power glove. Remember, did I, get, I think I got two wounds past, but all I needed was one wound for an instant death result, and that was the end of his Warlord. A brief moment of glory, then I failed my morale check and my Warlord got wiped out by his overrun move. Yeah, at this point my left flank had crumbled, not just a little bit, but completely crumbled. So that was suboptimal, and it was not in my battle plan at the start of the day. So he reconsolidated it, and it moved on to my turn too. So the first thing I did was I rolled for reinforcements. So this was where I actually had a bit more luck, and both my Rhino and my Land Raider arrived. So I diced for the table edge and my land raider appeared on my right flank so that's the flank with his missile launchers and the rhino appeared that ended up on the left flank so the rhino was kind of like a little bit on its own but i actually thought well that's maybe not too bad because now he's got to decide whether or not he's going to come after the rhino or continue pushing towards my center so let's just think about poses yeah i guess you could do that that looks like he's shooting a rat Hmm, could go for a looking the other way pose. Nah, I'm going to go that way. It looks more purposeful that way. So yeah, my reinforcements arrived, which is good. Now this uh, really helped. So the Land Raider moved on. who did a, just a normal advance move on the right flank. And then the Rhino did the same. My tactical marines that were in the centre start to fall back and the Duradio Dreadnought also started to fall back towards my right flank and my marines on my right flank continued their charge towards his missile launchers. However, they also started to move further right to stay out of the way of his tactical marines. So at this point, the whole battle was starting to wheel around itself and it was kind of like a, all the, with the deployment of my reserves, all of a sudden I was in a position where I was strong on my right flank and my opponent was strong on my left flank. 
and that is indeed what happened. Um, now, when it came to shooting this turn, things were much more profitable for the Iron Hands. The Deradio opened fire on his Contemptor again and knocked off another hull point, and then the Land Raider opened up with its triple LAS cannon battery and knocked off the final hull point, wrecking his Contemptor Dreadnought. So that was the end of that. So that was a big game changer because all of a sudden I had the only armour on the field. So that was good. Between my two tactical squads, I managed to flip more casualties on his missile launcher team. So they were starting to feel the pain a bit now. And that was that. Yeah, knocking out his contempt was, gave me uh, gave me a feeling of there was a chance, there was now a chance for the game again. My opponent's next turn, he continued to advance his breach marines in, down the center, his tactical marines continue to advance towards my tactical marines. His missile launch team held position. His destroyers and his Loctaris try, were having to navigate through the building. So they were all of a sudden a bit slowed down there, which was uh, useful for me. In his firing, well, there was, I think he might have done an, an odd casualty to me with some bolt of fire, but there was not actually all that, that much. I think he might have bagged someone with a plasma pistol shot if I remember rightly, but it wasn't actually too bad. Um, the worst thing that happened though was the his missile launch team let rip on the Land Raider and actually succeeded in knocking two of its four hull points off. So that was actually quite a lot of damage for the firepower it had available. So that that got me a bit worried because uh, you know missile launchers shooting at crack missiles at Land Raiders isn't exactly the most reliable firepower but he got, he got a good result. So yes, it, it kind of swung again but he didn't get any more charges in which was nice. Hmm. So that was his turn three. So actually, yeah, it, it was, that was his turn three but it, it kind of wasn't too bad for me again or wasn't as good for him as his previous turns have been. Now my turn three, I continued my movement towards my right flank checking that. Yeah, I continued my movement towards my right flank, which is good. The Land Raider advanced forward six advanced forward six inches again and deployed the Medusans who swarmed forward as far as they could, uh, which nicely put them in Volkite Charger range on his missile team. My tactical marines moved forward again on the right flank. The centre tactical marines, I brought them back to the left and basically screened the Dreadnought with them. To prevent him charging the dreadnought, so I could, I figured, I could lose the marines more than I could lose a dreadnought. That wasn't too bad actually, all in all. And then when it came to my shooting, I actually had a good round. The Medusans wiped out his missile launcher team with their Volkites, which is great. So the game was moving further in the direction of. my opponent having all the great infantry left but me having all the armour and also with wiping out his missile launcher team that left me pretty much entirely in control of my right flank whereas my opponent was in control of the left so the whole battle had wheeled round from sort of this orientation to this orientation so yeah that was a that was novel And at that point, we'd actually run out of time because it was a bit—it was an evening game, and sometimes you don't have enough time to play on. But we—we we also we could have played on a bit longer, um, although it was getting late. But we kind of looked at the battle, and it was probably about even in terms of damage done. But it was just quite funny that the whole thing had rotated um, through ninety degrees, and we just decided that well, you know, it was quite—we we quite liked how the game had got. And we decided we'll just sort of leave it as a a game where the two sides decided there was no point fighting any further and withdrew. And yeah, well, we, we just left it at that then. So yeah, it was a fun game. I certainly enjoyed it. It was quite... it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't an overly competitive game. I mean, my original... the original list I wrote for the game... Here's our fifth custodian. The original list I'd written for the game, uh, I'd had a Land Raider Achilles Alpha in my force, but after 
sort of we compared some initial notes and saw how much infantry my friend had selected. I said I'll swap that out because for um, I swapped it out for some extra medics and the Volkite team to make for a, a more balanced game, a more fun game. And that worked actually because otherwise if I'd had the Achilles Alpha I think that might have been a bit too much all I'd have had an awful lot of armour compared to his infantry and it wouldn't have been as much fun. Right, so there's Custodian 5. No, there's Custodian 4. These are really nice models, I think they're great. They certainly look the part. One left. Let's see if we can get this guy together a bit more quickly for to round us out for about an hour. So that was my battle, uh, Ultramarines versus Evil Iron Hands. I think, it, it, but yeah, it's a fun game, and I have newfound respect for the Loctaris squads when equipped with jump packs. They are formidable. Um, if you're fighting against standard Marines, yeah, they are quite dangerous. Right, so final custodian. Yeah, where's my last head? I want a bit of a shooting pose here, so I think I need to bend. Which way do I want to bend this? I might want to extend this arm a bit. Right, let's do that. Oops. Right, so, um, next topic. Next topic is Test of Honor. So, Test of Honor is a newly released game by Warlord Games. So, Warlord Games are, um, well, they're actually quite, a, they're almost like, a, they're part of a larger group. There's loads of companies around as part of this group now, lots of wargaming brands. But Warlord's quite a big one, and they're best known for bolt action. Uh, they're also the publisher of Beyond the Gates of Antares, which is a sci-fi skirmish war game based on the bolt action rules that um, Games Workshop veteran, or ex-Games Workshop veteran, Rick Priestley uh, wrote certainly the, well, I think the history and, and the rules for certainly the history. Yeah, so Test of Honor is a skirmish game and it's set in 17th century Japan. And it's basically, it's about skirmishes between bands of samurai and their retainers. I've not played this before, so this was the first game, a new experience. Actually, it was the first time my friend had played, so it's not been out long. So we did this little game, and in the game we, we had two even forces. We both had a samurai hero. Oh, it's a, so it's an individual kind of like skirmish game, so it's, it's probably designed for playing with maybe units around 10. Yeah, in the region of 10 to 12 models, I guess, maybe a bit bigger. So it's just, it is small games. It makes me think a bit. Um, it does make me think a bit of the old Games Workshop Mordheim game. It's that sort of, and I guess a bit like possibly Necromunda as well, in terms of smaller skirmish games or some interesting game mechanics to it as well. It uses the the typical Warlord Games approach of having bag of counters to represent your troops and you randomly draw them so the turn sequence is fluid uh, and each time you activate a unit it does all of its actions completes those and then you move on to the next unit um, before rounding out the t and the turn is rounded out because in amongst the all the unit markers or the unit activation tokens you've got three fake counters and once all three fake counters are drawn in a turn it's turnover. So sometimes, or quite often, not all units are always going to get to go in a turn. So it has that that kind of random fog of war element to it. Right. Okay. So just got some uh, just got some hot water because my other water got a little bit cool to work with. So I'm working on these uh, final arms. So I want this guy to be sort of like a, a running and shooting type pose. I need to drill this wrist out a little bit more. So Warlord Games, um, 
in Test of Honor. So the game we played, we had a samurai hero, three loyal spearmen each, and then two bowmen. And the loyal spearmen worked as like a single unit, whereas the bowmen worked as individuals, as did the samurai hero. Uh, so bowmen were armed with bows, the samurai heroes had katana, loyal spearmen had, surprise, surprise, spears. It's an, it's, it was a really interesting game. I do I, I do think it has some promise. Um, I like I like it, the game mechanics seem well suited to sm to a, to small skirmish games. It's got just that right sort of random element to it. I thought one thing I did really like about it was I always liked this about war games. The toughest unit in the game, so in this case, or the best unit, the samurai. Heroes were actually they had no they were no tougher in terms of taking damage than anyone else. So if you landed a hit, they were just as likely to be injured. And I always like a mechanic which allows the strong units to be killed by the weak, regardless of circumstance. So that was good. Um, I mean, the samurai obviously are faster, more skillful, and they're more likely to be able to dodge. But once you land that hit. Um, they're just as mortal as all the other people, which you know, it makes sense in the context. So that was good, and you kind of you have an act like a pool of action dice, and there's there's an interesting mechanic in there, which is the what's called the dishonor man mechanic. So you can increase your combat pool of dice, shall we say, by choosing to be dishonorable, because of course this is samurai, so. There is a code that it does imagine that the samurai are following the, a co you know, the code of Bushido when they fight. But you can choose to ignore Bushido and pull a dirty trick. If you do that, um, you boost your combat pool. However, just bending this, you also get a dishonor card, and dishonor cards come back to bite you in the posterior if you have to take morale check. So. For every dishonor card you've got, you kind of take a penalty on on each morale check you take for every dishonor card. So there was a really neat mechanic to it of knowing just at the right point when to be dishonorable to force a victory or to force a good result without then having that dishonor come back to get you. As it turned out, I managed to uh, take a samurai out of the game by doing a dishonorable attack and then a dishonorable damage at just the right point. It's a bit like playing poker as well, when, or blackjack, when you, it's kind of like the concept of when you play, you're playing a hand and you kind of start to see a hand developing well, but you've not yet got all your cards. But it's kind of like that thing where you can see a good, the potential for a good hand, and then you decide to go it, to increase your stake at that time to exploit the opportunity, and it's a bit like that. So I, I first took some dishonor, increasing my attack there, and when I got a really good attack, I realized it was, a good, it was a good opportunity to take even more dishonor to get a really strong damaging hit, and it worked out. So yeah, fun little game that. It, it was quite, it was quick to play. I mean, I think we played, we played it in probably about an hour and a half, and it was the first time we'd ever played it, so. Yeah, that was good. I'm sure we'll be playing more Test of Honor. You don't need many models for it, and the, the starter set's pretty inexpensive. So, well, you know, they've they've priced the whole thing. I think they've got the price point well positioned, if you ask me. So our final custo custodian is taking shape now. Oops. Well, he was taking shape for a moment until his body fell out. Oops, I've got a bit too much adhesive there. Maybe a spot too much. Let's wipe some of that away. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, test of honor. Good, good fun. Good fun. I think we're going to go to an event at Warlord Games in a few weeks' time. On test of honor, so but that'll be fun. We'll uh, have to have some reportage on that. 
Right, we're nearly done here. So let me move on to the final chat subject, which is the imminent release of the latest games, well, the latest part in the Dawn of War 40,000 series. So Dawn of War is quite a big thing in the gaming community. And well, if nothing else, it gave us some of the funniest voice acting ever in the history of PC gaming. Um, you know, and anyone who knows anything about metal boxes, steel rain, and how to uh, overpronounce space marines will appreciate Dawn of War. Yeah, so I think it's the 27th of April it's been released, and I noticed in G-Dub's, uh, in GW's emails that I'm getting from, the usual product emails, they're touting uh, Dawn of War. Try, they're, they're going with the pre-order this game, so, I mean, I'm not really that bothered about guessing it, I mean, to be honest, I, I, I don't, I don't, put time into playing computer games these days. I, I seem to spend most of my time either doing day-to-day -day life stuff or uh, doing, you know, this sort of model stuff. So uh, I don't I don't really have much time anymore for computer games. So it's not something I'm, I'm really looking to get, but I am always, I'm a bit, you know, you, you see these and I'm very suspicious of any pre-ordering any game these days. Um, I mean, why? Why bother pre-ordering the game? I mean, what what's the point of pre-ordering the game? There's no, uh, I, as I see it, there's every disadvantage to pre-ordering a game and no advantage. And put it this way, ever since my experience with No Man's Sky, which is a story for another day, uh, I will never buy a game again without uh, reading proper release copy reviews of it. So, yeah, so, um, I don't know. So it's interesting it's coming out. I don't know, it's, the critical opinion seems to be mixed at the moment. It seems to have gone in a very different creative direction to the previous games. And f as many people have pointed out, leaping Terminator Marines doesn't make sense. And the the chapter master of the Blood Raven seems to be Primark sized in this game. So I don't know if that's just the artwork being overdone, but yeah, it does look a bit silly. You know, Chapter Master's a normal marine size, basically. This guy's the size, as big as a Primark, and it looks really, it just looks silly. And it, yeah, looks silly, and it doesn't look authentic to the law. And Terminators don't jump. But yeah, so, uh, but yeah, so that will be interesting to see how that works out. So it's a big deal, a new Dawn of War game. You know, they, they take a long time to develop. I hope we get some, I hope there's some fun voice acting in it. Uh, it'll be fun to get some more comedy videos as we had with previous Dawn of Wars, which have uh, led to many hours of amusement on my part. Many wasted hours. Yeah, watching Bold Brothers. I'll leave a link to that in the description. You've probably seen it, but if you haven't, you should watch it. It's, it's hilarious. more bits of gluing then we're done Certainly seems to be a busy springtime in the whole hobby, you know, loads of releases at the moment and um, just lots going on and events coming up. It's Salute down in London in a couple of weeks, I will be going to Salute, as I mentioned before, doing a bit of a product research, shall we say, as well as just uh, taking in the site, seeing what's new in the hobby. Is that, I'm happy with this pose. I'm not sure if I'm entirely happy with this pose. I might dunk this guy in hot water later once he's fully set and do a bit more messing around. 
to get his arms just as I want them. I think I want his head there though. I do like these models, they're really nice. Really, really nice. And uh, it, the the shooter custodians suit my aesthetic more than the choppy ones. I know the choppy ones are nice models, but... Uh, these shooter ones are just more my style. So I'll be having to... I'm sure I'll be coming back to do a... A model and a rules review on these guys soon. Whoopsie. Hmm, so I covered quite a bit of ground chat chat wise this video so you have to let me know what you think about all the discussion you know be it ghost in the shell battle reports or what are your thoughts on the upcoming dawn of war 3 I'll be as always um, very interested to hear With his coming forward with his gun ready, pretty duty. I do like working with liquid you know, polystyrene cement or liquid poly, mainly because it smells like pear drops, and I like pear drops. Just quite, uh, quite funny, really, isn't it? There is Custodian Five. Moving forward purposely with his uh, bolt cliver. Ready to uh, bring the pain to the em enemies of his gene father. Cool. Right. I think we are. I think we're done there. So there you have it. Five Sagittarium Guard um, and a bit of uh, of heat bending to repose them. You know, introduce a bit of spice into the positions. I hope you found that a useful demo. Um, as always, let me know what you think down in the comment section. Thank you very much for watching. I will speak to you next time, and goodbye.